you know, there was another study by Cato and YouGov that found that. So among Americans who, you know, their highest level of education was a high school diploma, 25 percent of them reported being afraid of losing their jobs if they expressed their political beliefs. But for those with postgraduate degrees, it was 44 percent. Um, so basically half of people with the most education are worried that they'd lose their jobs if they openly express themselves. Um, I think that one potential consequence of that is that, you know, like basically half of the people with the most education in society are either not going to tell you what they really think or they're going to openly lie. Welcome to Lucas Scrobot Show. I'm Lucas Scrobot, and this is where we uncover purpose, pursue truth, and own the future. Today, we are joined by Robert Henderson. Now, Robert is a scholar. He is a writer and cr- contributor to both the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, City Journals, and much more. Robert graduated from Yale. He was in the Air Force, and now he is at Cambridge getting his PhD. Robert, thank you so much for joining us here on the show. Yeah, thank you for having me, Lucas. Now, I want to start kind of, we don't have a lot of time on the show, but I want to start with your name, Robert Kim Henderson, where your name comes from, because I really feel like that really is kind of a prerequisite to understand the context that you're coming from and and your work and your writing is really coming from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, my full name is Robert Kim Henderson. And so it's funny, I was actually just writing about this and I've written about this before, sort of the way that my name, like you're saying, can explain sort of where I came from. My first name comes from my birth father. he left my birth mother and I when I was very young. I never met him. Um, you know, I have no memories of him. And my middle name, Kim, comes from my birth mother. She was uh, an immigrant from South Korea. She's from Seoul, came to the U.S., um, got hooked on drugs, uh, started to basically spiral out of control. She was unable to care for me. Um, so I was put into adoption shortly, um, you know, basically when I was three years old, um, put into foster care, uh, when I was three in, in Los Angeles. And so spent the next few years living in foster homes. I lived in about uh, seven different foster homes over the span of about four and a half years, five years. And then I was adopted by the sort of, you know, working class, lower middle class family from a small, town in Northern California called Red Bluff. Um, so like pretty like poor blue collar town, uh, the median household income when I arrived there was about $27,000 a year. That's household income. Um, so then my adoptive parents, uh, you know, the new mom and a new dad, um, a couple years into the adoption, they got divorced and my adoptive father subsequently severed ties with me and his last name, of course, this was Henderson, uh, the name that was given to me um, upon the adoption. So, you know, one way to look at this is that each, uh, each one of my three names, Robert Kim Henderson, they come from adults who were sort of you know, meant to take care of me. These were supposed to be my, my parents, my parental figures, uh, whether through birth or through adoption. And in all three of those cases, um, they neglected their responsibilities. Mm. Would you say you you grew up feeling as if you were a victim then? I mean, you're a victim of all of these, you know, horrible circumstances in life. Did that really kind of mark you? You know, early on, not really. When you're in it, you don't think about it. Um, I mean, especially in foster care, because every person around me, like every kid, right, my peer group, the people I spend the most time around were my foster siblings. Um, and like students from schools in like low income, like poor areas in LA. So it's sort of, you can't really feel like a victim when everyone around you is living that kind of same life as you. Um, later on when I was adopted and started to sort of hang out more with other kinds of people, other kinds of friends and noticed that, you know, well, in high school, like my, these guys aren't sort of moving around in homes all the time. They didn't have the same kind of life I did, but even they sort of, um, you know, grew up kind of working class or poor, Um, most of them raised by single parents or grandparents or 
you know, some kind of arrangement like that. Um, none of my five closest friends in high school, none of them were raised by both of their birth parents. Hmm. Um, then, you know, I went to the military and then by the time I got to Yale, that's when I noticed the kind of, I guess, victimhood mindset, uh, where people seem to want to like embrace this, that, you know, if I went through some kind of hardship, then therefore I'm a victim. Um, you know, someone told me that I was a victim of these kinds of circumstances. And, you know, I guess in, in a way that is true, you know, I wasn't responsible for, you know, the circumstances of my early life of my childhood. Um, but I do think on the other hand, you know, thinking of yourself in that way, I mean, maybe if you're sort of affluent upper middle class kid at Yale, you can, you can think of yourself however you want, you're going to be fine. But if you would embrace that mindset um, in that kind of poor life, in that sort of impoverished life, um, it, you're just going to be mired in it. You're, you're never going to escape. I don't, you know, I don't think. I, I've never met anyone who came from the circumstances that I came from and had a victim mindset and escaped from it. Mm. How, how so? So it was it was the fact that you never embraced that victim mindset that you were able to take that personal responsibility, take action and actually move forward with your goals in life? Is that what you feel? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, a lot of it was, was just sort of a, sort of a pressure. Um, I knew that I didn't want to be, uh, I didn't want to remain where I was. Uh, I knew that the path I was on wasn't good. Um, I could see sort of like, as I thought about what's going to happen the next few years, you know, by the time I was in high school, 16, 17 years old, I was thinking like, what is my life going to look like later? I worked in, um, you know, I worked in a restaurant as a dishwasher and a bus boy. And a lot of my coworkers were sort of guys in their early mid twenties. Um, later I got a job at a, as a, as a sort of a bagger and grocery store clerk, same kind of thing, slightly older coworkers. And I thought like, is that the kind of life I want to live? You know, just sort of like smoking weed in parking lots and like trying to hook up with high school girls when I'm 23. Like, is that what I want to do? Riding around on like a beat up dirt bike. And I, I mean, like these guys seem to like have fun in a, in a way, but like they didn't seem happy. Uh, they didn't seem fulfilled. Um, and then when I thought even further, you know, when by the time you reach you know your 30s or 40s, that's not like that's not a life uh, for someone. So. um yeah, I just realized that, you know, all of these adults in my life had sort of let me down and maybe it was time for me to just sort of uh, take direction myself and sort of uh, take some initiative. Now, you mentioned how even though, you know, you're hanging out with these other 23 year old kids and you're, you're running around, you're having fun, but you're not happy, um, that cues me into a lot of things that you write about and statistics that we are seeing right now uh, across the West, at least, um, when it comes to nihilism, when it comes to suicide rates at all time highs, when it, when it comes to millennials not having friends and, and you cite that it is due to the breakdown and the erosion of the family unit. That's the, the thing that you point to. And in fact, you, you tweeted today that one of the strongest indicators of, of risky and sexual behavior when you're in your, I, I'm guessing, I didn't read the article, but teens and young adults is if you were in an unpredictable, unstable environment between the ages of zero and five. Can you, can you break right. down what is happening across Western culture and society? Yeah, well, okay, so that paper in particular, um, the question that they were asking was, you know, just what are the predictors of um, sort of juvenile delinquency, criminal behavior, teen pregnancy, sort of, do, you know, doing risky things that could get you hurt or in trouble? Um, and so the, the, two, the two key things they were looking at, one was uh, environmental harshness, what they called environmental harshness, which is essentially low socioeconomic status. Um, you know, or, you know, how much money do you have? How much money does your family have? The other question or the, the other factor they were looking at was environmental unpredictability, which is basically measured as um, how many different kinds of family structures you lived in in your childhood. Um, you know, how many divorces? how many different homes, how many sort of uh, marriages and remarriages and so on that you sort of go through or, or foster homes in my case, I guess. 
Um, and what they found was that the latter, this sort of unpredictability, uh, that kind of disorder and chaos in early childhood is, you know, much stronger predictor of, you know, later criminal behavior and getting into trouble, getting hurt. Than, uh, than poverty, which I think might surprise some people. I think we talk a lot about poverty in society, but we very rarely talk about stability and care and security for young children. Um, and I think this is what's going on. You know, there's a sort of broader question of what's going on in, in the U.S. and maybe in Western society more broadly is um, the breakdown of the family. Um, if you look at some of the s- statistics uh, the last, you know, six decades or so, um, so, for example, in 1960, if you look at um, you know, sort of uh, white collar and blue collar families, um, 95% of both sort of this upper class and the lower class families, 95% of children were raised by both of their birth parents in 1960s in the U.S. Uh, but by 2005, the upper class families, the sort of white collar affluent families, it dropped a bit. It dropped to 85%, but still the vast majority of sort of affluent college educated families uh kids are raised by both their parents uh but for the lower class the sort of blue collar families or uh, the children in those families in 2005 it had plummeted from 95 percent in 1960 to 35 percent in 2005 it was a massive drop so you sort of the, the affluent have sort of a little dip whereas the sort of working class uh essentially plummeted and now wow. it's more common than not for a kid um sort of how i grew up to not be raised by your birth parents, which is basically, you know, exactly what I saw uh, growing up. Um, like I said, none of my none of my high school friends were raised by their by both of their birth parents, and so I think that if you're raised in that kind of unpredictability and that kind of chaos um, in a situation where you don't have, you know, a stable two parent family, um, you don't. Yeah, I think it's it's harder to learn to trust people. It's harder to Sort of learn early on how to how to establish and build relationship, have that sort of sense of safety and emotional connection, and that willingness to be vulnerable uh, that you know children can have when they have a secure and 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 stable home environment. But you know, fewer and fewer people have that, mm. and I think this is giving rise to a lot of the cynicism and the nihilism that we're seeing now. And we can yeah, we can get into some of the statistics about how people feel about one another, how much they trust the government and elected officials and so on. But I think it, a lot of this starts with um, early childhood. And yeah, I, in one of your articles, you cited that 73% of those under 30 do not trust one of these. They, they say that they believe that people are just out for themselves and they're not going to look out for you. That's 73% of those under 30. 30 that's a shocking stat yeah yeah that that stats shocked me too um yeah yeah so that was a study by pew i think it was no was it last year and yeah they were basically looking at um rates of of trust between citizens in american society and one of the shocking findings was was the the sort of divergence between um between birth cohort or age essentially so if you look at millennials, you know, people roughly under 30, something like that, um, the levels of trust they have for one another, I, I mean, it's like, yeah, like you said, it's something like, you know, if, if they ask questions like, you know, do you trust other people to do the right thing? You know, are people out for themselves? Are people selfish? These, you know, in that vein, it ranges between like, yeah, roughly 60 to 70 percent basically think that those around them are selfish and self-centered and don't care about those around them. And for, um, I think this was for those over 65. So I don't know what the, it's not it baby boomers or the silent generation, something like yeah, that. I don't know. I, and the sort of senior citizens in America, um, the numbers were around 30 ish percent. So meaning in, in, in other words, about 70% of that group trusts other people. It's sort of the mirror image of the vast majority of older people. Um, there is some question about this, you know, is this a sort of cohort effect where people become more trusting over time, you know, so the older that you get, the more you grow, learn to trust people, or is this mm-hmm. something new and something recent such that, you know, the older people today, um, their levels of trust haven't changed at all. You know, maybe when they were 30 years old, they were just as trusting as they are now. Is this something new or is it something to do with age? Um, personally, I think it's something to do with the sort of times we're living in. I don't, 
I think maybe some of it is an age effect, but I think a lot of it is um, you know, these sort of skyrocketing levels of cynicism and mistrust because there's other research um, indicating that over time, people are uh, less trusting of institutions, of the media, of, uh, yeah, just, just uh, generally uh, other people around them. So over time, people become less trusting of people around them and institutions. And there's a, a similar correlation between uh, kids being born out of wedlock from what, 3% in the 1960s to what are we at? Uh, like 40%, 40%. in 2020. Um, yeah. you know, so that's a, a huge, huge boom over 60, 60 years. And you're saying that we're seeing a, a correlating, uh, at least correlating numbers, whether it's caused, you, you, you're not for certain, but at least there's a correlation in the rise of distrust among the under 30s. And you also cite uh, another article that 22% of millennials say they have no friends. Like this is like, this is like, this should disturb us. This should really disturb us that people in society say they have no friends. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that was the highest. So among all of the sort of age groups, um, you know, whatever baby boomers and, and so on, um, it was the millennials, the youngest, the youngest group, which I think surprises people the sort of the younger people are the ones who are the most likely to say they have no friends. Yeah. Because you know, I think when you think of like friends hanging out, you always think of like young people partying and whatever, having a good time. But there are a lot of lonely young people out there. And one reason for this, you know, potentially, I think, is that, you know, like I said, if it's if you can't if you if you don't learn early on to develop relationships um, with your parents, with you know, adults, with the people you're supposed to trust, it becomes harder later to do so. Um, that's one factor. I think another thing is going on here too. I think people are becoming um, more fearful of getting close to people because I think like we're seeing something strange happen here. I, I have no data for this. This is pure speculation, but this kind of cancel culture, the sort mm. of outrage culture that we're in where, you know, every day we're seeing people who are throwing others under the bus for likes for, you know, what, what, what the kids are calling clout now. Um, and I think people are, are worried about getting close to others and, and being vulnerable because they're worried about being hurt. Um, it's, uh, I think this is another, another factor here. It's not just that we're having, we're seeing people who early on don't learn to develop relationships, but, but even now, even if they wanted to, they're just afraid because they don't want to say the wrong thing or post the wrong thing or, or take that social or emotional risk because they fear that sense of betrayal. I mean, we're seeing people sort of get, mobbed on social media every single day and as a young person um you know it, sort of social ostracism hurts all of us there's mm. plenty of social psychology research on how you know social ostracism is one of the most undesirable most unpleasant things that we can experience but for adolescents and young adults like it hits them especially hard um so i think this is something else that's going on as well oh well, yeah and, and with that what, what we're seeing right now is people are drudging up, you know, stuff from years back, tweets from years back, or there's a, a recent um, story of a guy who saved um, a Snapchat or a video, private video of a girl saying the N word until she got accepted into her college and then released it so that she wouldn't get accepted. And so it, it seems, as you said, it seems like there um, is this, this fear that's happening in society due to cancel culture um, uh, of being afraid of what to say and the self-censorship. My question to you with that is, you know, which comes first, the, the chicken or the egg? Like, do we have, are we self-censoring ourselves because we don't feel like we can trust people because we don't feel like we have real true friends or a family unit that has our back or a support system in our life and therefore we're making sure that, you know, we're always saying the right things in front of the right people, or is it that cancel culture is kind of moving forward and that, that, that moving dartboard of the Overton window, as you coin it, um, 
is is moving forward and therefore we're becoming less trusting because of what's happening in the culture like wh- or is it a cycle yeah yeah i mean i think i think every like all of these factors sort of bleed into each other it's hard to it's hard to isolate specifically i mean the self censorship phenomenon has been interesting to see um yeah, one of the studies that I've cited on, on self censorship is basically, um, you know, so the, the title of the paper is kind of uh, amusing. It's uh, it's called "Keeping Your Mouth Shut." Um, you know, self censorship since the 1950s, something like that, by these two political scientists. Um, and basically, what they found, you know, they were they were curious about how many Americans are afraid to express themselves. And you know, starting in the 1950s, where they started their their sort of research. Um, you know, people think of McCarthyism during that era as like this, the, the peak of people being targeted for their political beliefs, people who are afraid, the sort of red scare, um, people who might harbor communist sympathies could be targeted. But what they found is that um, only 13% of Americans reported being uh, afraid of speaking their minds, um, which isn't very high, 13%. And to, just to compare, by the 1980s, it had jumped to 20%. Uh, of Americans afraid to express themselves. And by 2019, uh, it was 40%. So 40% of Americans became afraid to express themselves. And there wasn't a a partisan difference, interestingly. This was Democrats and Republicans, about 40% were afraid to express themselves. But what the researchers did find when they broke it down by education level, they found that the higher your education, the more afraid people were to express themselves. Which, you know, to, I mean, in a way, you might think that's counterintuitive because you might think that, oh, it's the people who have sort of the, the least education, the least money, the least resources. They're the ones who are sort of timid and maybe, um, you know, not so willing to be forthcoming because they don't want to you know, be at risk. But it's actually the people who are highest in society. Yeah. Um, you know, there was another study by Cato and YouGov that found that. So among Americans who, you know, their highest level of education was a high school diploma, 25 percent of them reported being afraid of losing their jobs if they expressed their political beliefs. But for those with postgraduate degrees, it was 44%. Um, so basically half of people with the most education are worried that they'd lose their jobs if they openly express themselves. Um, I think that one potential consequence of that is that, you know, like basically half of the people with the most education in society are either not going to tell you what they really think or they're going to openly lie. Um, and it's hard to know, like, <laughs> which is which here. But, um, yeah, as far as you know, what, what are the factors here? I think, you know, in addition to the the family, uh, in addition to the sort of the social media mob craze, although it's related to that, the cancel culture stuff, I think is um, this kind of, you know, this preference falsification. Um it's not simply that people are afraid of getting canceled, but they also want to look good to their friends. You know, they want to sort of fit in. I remember over the summer um, during the George Floyd you know, demonstrations, a lot of people on Instagram were posting that black circle black square or the black black square. Rather, it was a square. Um, and people I knew who were not really interested in politics, people who I knew who privately were critical of the protests and the riots and whatnot, um, you know, who confided to me privately saying, you know, they didn't agree with it, but they still posted that black square because everyone was doing it. Um, that's and dangerous. I think there's, oh, I'm sorry. I said that's dangerous. Right. Yeah. And so everyone is looking at their Instagram thinking everyone else, you know, is posting this, so I should post it too. Um, you know, they want to get the likes, they want to get the social validation. There's a lot going on here um, where people are prioritizing things other than you know, telling the truth or saying what they really think. Now, what 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 happens, in, in your opinion, to culture when people start either not saying what they really believe or blatantly lying about what they believe? I mean, don't didn't we see this? In uh, the USSR, with the the kangaroo courts and the mock trials, where people would, you know, confess to crimes that they know they didn't commit. Like, didn't we? Haven't we seen this in history before? Like, isn't this a slippery slope that we could be on? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think that that's that's one possibility. If people grow comfortable with lying, um, this did happen. Yeah, in the 
USSR. So there's a British historian, Robert Conquest. Um, he wrote this book, The Great Terror, basically documenting what happened uh, in the Soviet Union, um, you know, especially during the, the purges, Stalin's purges, where he was sort of, you know, just going going wild, like eliminating his enemies. Um, and one of the, the interesting passages in that book from, from Robert Conquest, he says, um, you know, he, was, he was basically saying, like, why did so many of these Soviet citizens confess to crimes that they didn't commit and that everyone else knows they didn't commit? Um, everyone sort of knew that it was uh, it was sort of a dog and pony show. It was a kangaroo court. Like, they all know that it's nonsense, but they're all going along with it. And the person is going along with it, too. And I think, uh, so, so Conquest basically goes on and he says, um, he speculates here. One reason is that they grew so used to lying. Um, their whole lives had been a lie. You know, their sort of loyalty to the regime, the kinds of things they were supposed to believe. They're sort of like the way that they went about their work day, what they told the, you know, their families and so on. It was all, they, they knew that there were informants everywhere. Um, and so just, okay, well, if you're lying all the time, what's one more lie? What's one more like, okay, yeah, I did that. That's, we sort of grow numb to it. Um, I think that we could possibly be seeing something like that, you know, not, not nearly to the same degree, but I think that, you know, maybe people aren't, you know, they're not going to be like going through the sort of official legal courts, um, but they will be going through the sort of court of public opinion the reputations can be uh, you know, undermined. Their character can be assassinated. Um, there are a lot of reputational risks to this, which, of course, can bleed over into you know, employment risks. It can actually have real material consequences for people. So what, what, what is the solution? You know, to, to wrap this up, you know, here's you know, massive problems, you know, societal problems, widespread, obviously, you know, you and I are not going to solve it here in this conversation. And one individual isn't going to be able to solve it. But when we think about our, our kids, our grandkids, and the world that we want them to grow up in, what are some of the things that we might be able to do to at least break these cycles so that our kids grow up having friendships, so our kids grow up you know, trusting other people, our kids can grow up speaking truth. How can we break this cycle? I think one, one would be to simply, you know, uh, do your best to raise your kid in an environment where the likelihood of them being sort of emotionally healthy is highest. And that, you know, the research is, is very clear on this is a sort of two parent family um, two parent family that's stable where both parents are available and around. And, um, look, I know there's a lot of controversy about, you know, divorce, for example, about, you know, is it better for the, you know, the parents to be unhappy, but together or happy and apart? Well, you know, I, I took this from, from, uh, you know, one of my, one of my sort of favorite, uh, uh writers and, and public figures, Dr. Drew Pinsky. Um, you know, he says that if you have children, um, you know, you are not living for yourself anymore. Like it's not your life anymore. It's your children's life. Wow. So you don't get to live for whatever you want. You have to do what's best for your kids. And so, you know, before you have kids, I mean, if you want to do whatever you want, you know, okay, that's your life. But once you have children, it's not your life, it's their life. Mm. And so think about that. Um, so I think that's, that's one way that we, we can all sort of have some control over you know, the future is you know, how we treat the next generation in, in our, you know, in our own families. That's a, that's a powerful answer, Robert Henderson. Thank you so much for joining us here on the show. You can find Robert at his website, Robert or Rob K Henderson, or on Twitter and Instagram at Rob K Henderson. And, uh, I love your writing. Thank you so much for joining us on the show and your, your last kind of call to action. I I really loved, I really appreciate that. It is powerful. I have four kids, four boys and so uh, it's true that, um, you know, once you have kids, your life is not <laughs> your own. <laughs> like someone else owns it and you got to live with them. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lucas. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Don't go away. We'll be right back with our closing Weaver and Loom segment. Welcome back to Weaver and Loom, the segment of the show where we take 
ancient quotes and we apply them to our everyday life to connect us back to our purpose, meaning, and original design so that we can weave our destinies and own our futures. Today's quote comes from Leo Tolstoy. He says, everything depends on upbringing. Everything depends on upbringing. What Robert said in that final call to action of how once you have kids, your life is not your own. It, it doesn't belong to you anymore. I thought it was, I was just so profound. It was so fitting. And when I, I read this quote, everything depends on upbringing. It's true. The ages from zero to five are the biggest predictors of where you're going to end up later on in your life, upbringing. When we have kids, we have a responsibility. And that responsibility rests on our shoulders to bring them uprightly, to pour into our kids, to create an environment, to create an upbringing for our children to grow up in so that, so that why? So that they can shape a better future, shape a better tomorrow. Maybe it's one person. Maybe it won't change all of society. Benjamin Franklin says this on parenting. He says, educate your children to self-control, to the habit of holding passion and prejudice and evil tendencies subject to an upright and reasoning will. And you will have done much to abolish misery from their futures and crimes from society. We can't control everything. But if we can control the environment that they grow up in, and that is on us, that is on us as parents to control the environment that our kids grow up in, whether it's the, the school system that they grow up in, whether it's the, the media that they consume, whether it's the atmosphere in the house, the way that we talk to one another, sarcasm that we use with one another, what they observe going on, the attitudes and language and behavior that they observe going on within a household, that atmosphere is what our children grow up in. It's like the soil that they grow up in. But if we can control that, and if we can teach our kids to use self-control, to restrain themselves against the passions and prejudices and the evil that lurks, those tendencies that lurk within each and every one of us, then we will have done much to make their lives happy, and make society better. That is all for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoy this podcast, please tell your friends, write them a letter, WhatsApp them, message them. Um, but whatever you do, tell them and make sure that you're subscribed to the show, whether it's on YouTube or whatever podcast platform that you listen on. Finally, remember, you are a person who seeks truth, connects with your purpose so that you can own your futures and help your children own theirs.